Great. So I just wanted, so I'm David Walde again. Um, I use pro, the he, him pronouns. I uh, live in central Brooklyn where I am active in my chapter, but also I am very involved in the DSA Fund, which is the, the sister uh, nonprofit to our wonderful organization where I focus on a bunch of socialist education. Um, but I am, but more importantly, I am very excited to be here with all of you. It really means a lot for me as someone who joined DSA, I can't believe it, almost 20 years ago when I was a, a student at, at a small school in Maine, uh, involved in the YDSA chapter there to be still in, in an organization that I never thought would get this big. And I am really, really uh, excited and ecstatic that socialist majority um, exists. I feel socialist majority in many ways uh, bridges the best of the DSA that I joined when I was a young man um, and, and really will make the organization even stronger. Um, and I think that's partly because even though social majority is a caucus, it's a caucus that always puts DSA first. And that's like what kind of what we joke and say, we're like the uncaucus caucus. And so we also share some of the core beliefs that brought me to uh, the socialist movement. Uh, that includes, you know, really uh, a commitment to coalition work with, especially with other uh, progressive and labor organizations. Also, uh, a real strong agenda that wants to build the left, but also fight the right, including Trump. We view those as two critical things that we need to do. Um, a real genuine commitment to both recruiting and organizing in multiracial spaces. And I will also say to really be part of struggles that are tackling oppressions that exist in all other walks of life. So today you're gonna to see a little bit more about what I mean by that as we discuss uh, our resolutions coming up for the 2021 uh, DSA convention. Um, and you'll hear more about what we're promoting and what we've participated in shaping. In addition, you're gonna meet our five wonderful national political committee, which is the DSA's leadership candidates, uh, including three incumbents that are running again. And you'll have a, a chance uh, to actually ask them questions in Two, two rounds of breakout rooms that we will host um, in addition to hearing from them as candidates. So it'll be both, it'll be a two-way street. So that's going to be an excellent democratic opportunity for you all. Um, and I just want to remind you all, because I think some people just come in, this will be recorded for uh, posterity and to show with other delegates, but for now, um, I just want to hand it over to uh, Ali LaHaye, who is the former co-chair of East Bay DSA in the great state of California and an abortion doula as well. So thank you, Ali. Thank you for the intro. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali. I go by she, her pronouns. I used to be the East Bay DSA co-chair. Now I'm just a regular DSA member. Um, but more importantly, I am a socialist feminist and I like winning and I like building power and that's why I'm in socialist majority and that's why I joined socialist majority because I think we, SMC is what we also call ourselves in case you didn't know, I believe we have the strategy and leadership to win, po to win power, to win and build power. Um, I think first by engaging the working class where they're at. Um, and bringing them into socialism and converting them to socialism for lack of a better term. And that we really believe in working on material struggle and making sure that people have wins that directly impact our, their lives. Um, and also building a supportive culture in DSA, I think is really important. Um, I want a DSA where people wanna show up to the next meeting and that they're excited about joining and that we are unapologetically recruiting to our organization that is mass, that is reflects the multiracial working class, and that it's not about being right all the time. <laughs> um, and it's not about having a 100% right analysis or predicting what's going to happen next in the economy. But I believe it's about building a serious and a serious organization with principled leadership 
and that our caucus is about putting our heads down and putting in the work to win. Um, and I also, um, this, I already got through my speech pretty fast, <laughs> but I just want to share that I joined this caucus because um, I just read it online, funny enough, and was like so inspired by not only the ideology by SMC, but also by the list of people who are involved. I oftentimes call us the co-chair caucus because we have so many chairs of different uh, chapters and committees and things that I think that says a lot to how serious we are about putting in the work to make DSA win. Um, and also what kept me in SMC is that I went through, you know, lots of different convention drama that happens um, last year or two years ago in 2019. And the big thing that happened was I was in an email chain and then I was really stressed. And right at the most stressed moment, Sam Lewis gave me a phone call who is in Socialist Majority as a co-founder of Socialist Majority. Um, and that to me says a lot about the support I got uh, from leadership. Um, and also just the ways in which we solve conflict, I, says, I think says a lot about how seriously we take our organization. Um, so I'm super excited to hear about all of the different convention proposals that sort of speaks to this vision um, and what our caucus is putting out there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Tim to talk a little bit about Beyond 100K and how we're gonna build the mass organization we want. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, can y'all hear me okay? Great. Uh, so my name is Tim Zhu. I am a DSA member, an SMC member based out of the DC area. In my day job, I think constantly about how to build the infrastructure that allows us to bring in new union members, not by the ones and twos, although those are important too, but by the hundreds and thousands. I think all the time about the working class people that aren't in the union, but could be if only something was different. And for this reason, I think about the people that we're not talking to. And that's why I resonate with my fellow caucus members in SMC for this reason. Uh, we all have our eyes on the prize, a socialist majority that can build, take and wield power. And we simultaneously strive to model a culture of care and warmth, a communal culture that fights against insularity constantly. So all of this is implicit in why we as a caucus are championing the Beyond 100K resolution. So just a little bit of history here, the original 100K resolution that passed in 2019 set us an objective of creating a specific plan to reach 100K, focused on recruiting, retaining, training, developing socialist or organizers, both at the local level within chapters and at a national scale, and mandated a particular focus on black and brown working class and queer and women working people. It created the Growth and Development Committee, which set to work developing materials, programming, and more. So I was attracted to join the Growth and Development Committee because I'm tired of feeling marginal. I want us to be huge. As a member of the Growth and Development Committee these past few years, I can say that the members of the committee have worked tirelessly to enact the previous resolutions. So just as examples, we ran a recruitment drive that brought in over 12,000 new dues paying members in a, a, just a six week period. We trained hundreds upon hundreds of new organizers through the organizing school and dozens of other trainings, as well as compiling our first ever training resource library where members and chapters can request trainings, uh, can pull training materials so they don't have to develop something from scratch. We welcomed and onboarded thousands of new members through our nearly bi-weekly Q&A and new member orientation calls. And we also brought inactive and at-large members into action through intentionally focused retention efforts. So this new Beyond 100K resolution takes the lessons we've learned, builds on successes and picks up plenty of unfinished work to evolve further. This includes implementing a national training program, mentoring chapters to select and prioritize issue campaigns that establish a poll of socialist anti-racist anti politics of solidarity, not based in race essentialism or separatism, uh, but focusing on things that have a greater material impact and salience for the black indigenous and people of color sections of the working class. We wanna build intentional and continuous recruitment efforts through strategic political campaigns that are resonant with populations rooted in the multiracial working class. Uh, we wanna work with the National Political Education Committee to develop chapter specific programming, running a national dues drive to improve retention rates and fully integrating with YDSA and recruitment of young people generally into all of these strategies, working with YDSA leadership to develop a particular strategy directed towards young people with a priority towards youth recruitment beyond HBCUs, community colleges, trade schools, high schools, and other sites and institutions that have potential for youth recruitment. So that's the Beyond 100K resolution in a nutshell. And I think it's a no brainer, vote for it if you're a delegate. 
And with that, I will pass the mic to my amazing comrade and NPC candidate, Mikeiko James. Thank you so much, Tim. Love hearing you talk about Beyond 100K and the work of the GDC. It gets me all fired up. Um, and Ali, too, you've done incredible work leading this caucus and your chapter and all the fun things that we're going to be doing together in DSA moving forward. We have so much work to do, but I'm really glad I get to do it with SMC. Um, my name is Maikiko. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in Los Angeles. As Tim said, I'm a member of the current NPC. I'm also a member of the Growth and Development Committee, as well as our personnel Committee and the National Abolition Working Group and the Afro Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus, all of all of which I'm so proud to be a part of and have really shaped who I am in DSA. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about organizing culture because that's a really important tenet to socialist majority. So how to build an organizing culture is a strategic question. If we want power, we need to grow. And if we want to grow, we have to be a place where people want to be. And with the world being as hard as it is right now, we don't need to make it any harder in the spaces where we organize. This isn't to say we shouldn't disagree or debate. Being multi-tendency to me is one of the most important qualities of DSA because it compels us to navigate across tensions and really try to understand one another. And it also compels us to find common ground because we do need to set plans in motion in order to win and gain what we need. And for that, there has to be some levels of agreement. There isn't any way around that. Um, but we're not inherently agreeing simply because we're all DSA members. It is entirely possible to be kind to people with whom you disagree. It's possible to have spicy takes online without alienating or harming fellow organizers or the organization. And I think that's a really important but nuanced take as we know in the Twitterverse of it all. Um, and it's also possible, if not imperative to understand as abolitionists, we need to explore more humanizing models of justice and reconciliation, both in our society and in our organizing space. And we must strive to create spaces that are as safe as possible and dig into what that means as we have people coming from all these different walks of life and experiencing different things. And they're so complicated. These dynamics are so complicated, but that means we have all the more responsibility to take them on and build culture around them. Um, because some, they're some of our most complicated dynamics, they will take more time. But I think some of our most strategic work is about creating a culture of organizing that allows for as many of us as possible to be here, especially if we are those whose power has been systemically and culturally oppressed. And for me, socialist majority has always been a model um, in these ideas, holding fast to our anti-racist and socialist feminist principles. Um, and I'm so inspired and encouraged by all of the members of this caucus every day. I could not get through um, the many hours of work we do for DSA without them. Um, they make it a joy. And that's also really important to organizing culture is that we enjoy doing the work because we know we're here to win and we're going to win a world for all people. So with that, I will hand it over to another amazing comrade, Renee, who's going to talk about more structure. Uh, hi all, Renee, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm currently an East Bay DSA member, um, NYC Emerita. Um, I am gonna talk about the National Organizing Committee. Um, this is a proposal that Sam Lewis and I put together and that the caucus is endorsing and, and uh, supporting at this convention. And it would basically create um, a new national organizing committee of about a hundred people under the NPC that would um, be more of a deliberative body. Um, and this is a revised version of a proposal that we um, put forward at the last convention that got tabled. So DSA, as we all know, has had huge growth over the last few years, but um, we have the same size NPC. Um, it's literally we've grown 15 times as big and have kept the same number of people running the national leadership. Now, these people are great. My kid goes great. Christian's great. Kevin's great. Sabrina will be great. Jose will be great. All the NPC may be great, but it's still just 16 people for an organization of nearly 100,000. So why do we have national leadership bodies, right? So one thing they do is they govern the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. They make the decisions that keep the lights on. And this is something that the NPC is really well suited to do. It's a small group of folks who meet frequently or in frequent contact with one another. Great. Some other things, though, that national um, leadership bodies could do is represent members as constituents. If you're a rank and file member and you want to 
do something nationally, you want to understand something that's going on nationally, how long does it take you to find someone who's in national leadership? If you have the NPC, you're one of 6,000 people that, that someone's being virtually represented, and you don't necessarily have someone who's assigned to you. The NOC would, would create regional representation, so you'd have people who were assigned to represent your region, and it would seriously decrease the number of people that each NOC member is sort of virtually representing. Um, the, the second thing I think that we think that the NPC is not a great space to do is to really deliberate some of these political issues. When things get to the NPC, they're often you know, contentious votes, people tweet about them, people don't necessarily feel heard because it's such a small body that has so much work to do. Um, if we had a space that was larger, that had um, a lot of multi-tendencies where people could talk to one another, feel like they're in a deliberative body, it might take some of the pressure off of like um, hot take Twitter or other places in the organization where we end up debating these issues in ways that aren't necessarily generative. Um, this, uh, the structure of this proposal really came out of um, Sam and my, um, the experience of Sam and me, sorry, at, <laughs> in New York with the um, Citywide Leadership Committee. The CLC is, um, was created in 2017 um, to be a much broader leadership body under the steering committee. And it really made it a lot easier for folks to one, know what leadership was doing, to plug into those decisions, and two, to work through some of the thorny political disagreements Mike Kiko was talking about. We disagree with one another on some things. Let's have a place where we can really talk it out in a way that's not under the gun of having to run this huge sprawling volunteer-led member organization. Um, and that's basically the idea behind the NOC. It would um, provide a lot more um, people in this, this sort of intermediate, um, sorry, I, I uh, failed to, to say a talking about, it would create a much bigger intermediate layer of national leadership who can take responsibility for the political direction of the organization. So our experience in New York was once the CLC was in place, it, it really decreased the temperature of people's um, uh, fights with one another and made them much more about the politics than about the personalities. And it really made it a lot easier for ordinary members, for rank and file members to, um, know what was happening. And, you know, for me, when I first came into NYC DSA, I had something that we had to talk to steering about. And it literally took like, I didn't know who steering was. It took a month to get connected. Um, once the CLC was in place, there was always someone at a branch meeting who was a member of that leadership body. So that's the NOC. Um, basically a, a, a way to increase our national leadership structures to reflect our huge growth and uh, create some space for, for deliberation and um, all that good stuff. Anyway, I am now gonna throw it over to um, our amazing uh, next NPC candidate, uh, Christian Hernandez from the great state of Texas. Thanks so much, Renee. Um, so, hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Christian Hernandez. I'm based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, ella, um, and I'm a current member of the NPC, uh, as well as a member of the steering committee uh, and the steering committee of the GDC, um, on the training subcommittee, uh, convention co-chair, and a liaison to the abolition working group alongside my Kiko and Kevin. Um, I previously served as a co-chair of North Texas for two terms. Uh, where the focus of my work was not only in building up the chapter, but also our members as organizers by creating and implementing organizing trainings. And before that, before DSA, um, I joined DSA in 2016. I was involved in immigrant rights work, uh, which I've been doing for over six years now. As far as my DSA campaign work, I led our chapter efforts in successfully winning paid sick time for over 300,000 workers and being part of the coalition that not only brought this victory to the South, but got it implemented. Um, I also led our chapter efforts for Bernie's 2020 presidential campaign um, and, and all the work that came with that. Um, outside of DSA in 2018 and 2019, I worked on public safety and defund campaigns, spearheading budget demands informed by community surveys. Um, I say all that because I would not be running for NPC without SMC. Um, being on the NPC isn't easy work, 
there are a lot of expectations, a lot of work, and the last two years have been a series of crisis after crisis on the national and global level. I've been able to sustain myself in this work because of the other SMC and PC members and because of the support and care from my fellow SMC comrades. Um, earlier this year, I got COVID and recently tragically lost two family members. Um, and I was able to take a break and focus on rest and grieving and healing thanks to my SMC comrades. Um, at the 2019 convention, a mass shooting targeted Texans who look like me. And I remember giving a speech to support our El Chuco comrades. Um, and much like in this moment, I found myself um, almost unable to finish the speech, but hearing we got your back being yelled by comrades is what got me through it. Um, and that feeling of support and solidarity and love is what I want every single person in DSA to feel, to experience, um, which is why I think that the decisions that we make at convention are so consequential. The work we prioritize is part of that, yes, but how we do that work and how we lead is so much more of that. Um, okay, <laughs> now we can talk about the resolutions. Um, I want to first uh, speak to the importance of supporting mass abolition work in the organization. The decades long work of black feminist thinkers and organizers have clearly laid out how policing and prisons have been used as tools of class warfare, as instruments of white supremacy that reinforce racial disparities and violence. And the uprisings and demonstrations both here and abroad showcase both the international nature of this work and how crucial it is that we foreground these connections with contention with intention. Um, as socialists, we are fighting for ownership of the decisions that affect our lives. And abolition too is about owning our responsibilities to each other to address harm and transform through care rather than violence or involving the state in our conflicts. And I think this requires a deeper understanding and practice of abolitionist politics and a rejection of the premise upon which capitalism is founded on our own disposability. A commitment to abolition is a rejection of violence between individuals from the state and from the oppressive systems that govern our society. Abolition is a key political struggle, which is why as DSA, we must outline what our role is in this work. Uh, and most importantly, how we ensure that abolitionist frameworks are woven into our existing work. We want this demand to be felt not just in the streets, but in our workplaces by ensuring that workers are doing their part in supporting these demands. Another resolution that I urge uh, delegates here tonight um, and other delegates to support is resolution four, the calling for a mass campaign for voting rights. Much of the power, leverage, and confidence built in DSA has been a result of electoral work, whether to elect socialist candidates or win local issue-based demands. The 2020 general election was consequential, not only because there was a defeat of Trump, but because I'd argue it served as a catalyst for the right to settle on a strategy of coming after voting rights. To date, 47 states have been considering restrictions and 22 have already enacted laws, especially in the South. The integrity of the vote is an essential aspect of mass political participation. Whether people vote or not, the ballot box is often the most obvious form of participation for folks and presents the opportunity for us as socialists to engage the working class in dialogue and move them not only into fighting for what they deserve, but clarifying who moves the levers of power and who can give us what we want. Moreover, voter suppression tactics have a disproportionate impact on the most under-resourced members of the working class, especially Black and incarcerated people, through voter ID laws, lack of voting rights for the formerly and currently incarcerated, and for the millions of undocumented and temporary status individuals. I think we need a mass campaign because this work must be visible, must be as visible as the Republican fuckery and more deeply felt than the half-hearted attempts by the Democrats to protect their wins. And because this work would buttress our existing work, electoral or not, by cohering the working class electoral base needed for, um, for this transformation by simply bringing more people into the struggle through deliberate efforts to expand our base. And I know very few people who have done more to make our electoral work as powerful as it is than Sabrina Chan, which is why I'm so proud to be running alongside her and uh, you will be hearing from next. Thank you, Christian. So my name is Sabrina, I use she or they pronouns. Um, I'm based at a Chicago DSA and I'm currently serving my second term on the National Electoral Committee. So I've considered myself a socialist uh, since I was a teenager, teenager, but I first put my socialist politics into practice through electoral politics. I was by Bernie, volunteering for the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 during my final year of college. 
Um, and I traveled all over knocking on doors for him. I, you know, knocked on the doors um, in the south side of Chicago. I went to Iowa. I went to Wisconsin. I went to the Bronx. Um, and I did all that canvassing for, for many reasons. Um, you know, for the first time, I saw someone talking seriously about socialism, uh, you know, on the national stage for the first time. And I, and I thought, like, this is our best chance um, to win socialism. Um, and, you know, I really wanted, uh, it, you know, to pass things like Medicare for all and to, you know, fight climate change. Um, and so, you know, I was devastated when Bernie lost the primary, primary and then, you know, even more devastated when Donald Trump won the general election. But um, I felt politically homeless and lost for a while. But, you know, eventually I found DSA, which has been my political home since December 2017. And I found DSA through electoral politics. Um, so four years ago, Chicago only had one socialist alderman, Carlos Ramirez Rosa. Um, and at the time I found DSA, you know, he briefly tried to run for Congress. And one of my first DSA meetings ever was a Chicago DSA electoral working group meeting where we went out to collect petition signatures to get him on the ballot. Um, and so since joining DSA, you know, I've, I've been heavily involved in our electoral work, whether locally in the 2019 Chicago municipal elections or nationally uh, through the National Electoral Committee where I've now served for three years. Um, and on the NEC, I, I am most proud of, um, you know, my, my work helping to rewrite our national electoral strategy, um, launching a fundraising program for our nationally endorsed candidates, which I will drop a link to after I'm done talking, um, which has raised almost $50,000. Uh, you know, hopefully, can we get over $50,000 on this call? That'd be really amazing. Um, and also helping to draft uh, Resolution 8 toward a mass party. On the NEC, I also chair our endorsement subcommittee, which I have done my entire time. And it's just a joy to be able to talk to chapters and hear about the electoral work that they are doing. Uh, and so I believe, you know, electoral work in DSA is just so important. And the NEC is trying to support as many chapters as possible, you know, who want to do electoral work. And, you know, many members have come into DSA through our electoral work, you know, whether through Bernie or AOC or a local candidate, you know, including me, you know, someone, who had no idea that you know she would have gotten this involved in DSA and would be running for MPC just four years later, um, and you know for better or for worse, electoral uh, politics is or uh, you know elections are how people relate to politics, and so you know for that reason I think electoral organizing should be a central pillar of our work, and you know if we are to take electoral organizing seriously as a train of struggle. Uh, you know, against the capitalist class, then I think we need to adequately resource and fund our electoral organizing efforts. And I think one step toward doing that is passing resolution eight toward a mass party. Um, and this resolution was written collaborative, collaboratively by members of the National Electoral Committee and represents, uh, you know, multi-tenancy uh, consensus on electoral organizing in DSA, members of SMC, BNR, and CPN helped draft this. Um, and sort of the major, uh, you know, the major outcomes of this resolution are twofold. One, it states our consensus position on electoral work. You know, it affirmatively, state, affirmatively states that uh, the goal of DSA and our chapters is to build, uh, you know, a mass working class party, but also for the first time clarifies what we mean by a party. Um, and by a party, we mean a mass democratic political organization capable of taking state power with a strategy uh, for social transformation. And second, the resolution calls for putting resources behind uh, supporting electoral work, including calling for closer collaboration between the NEC, MPC, and national staff, and calls on us to hire, um, you know, more or you know, staff, more staff. Only have one part-time staffer uh, dedicated to electoral work, um, but calls on hiring more staff so that we can ensure that the NEC and the national org uh, can empower. Uh, members to keep organizing working class people and, you know, build up their chapters and, you know, give people the skills that they need to win elections and then, you know, elect socialists to office who can deliver transformed or performs that improve working class people's lives. Um, I've been talking enough, so I want to pass it over to Kevin Richardson, who's uh, running for the MPC, and he's going to talk about the uh, multi-racial organizing committee, I believe. Uh, hi, okay. 
So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kevin He Him from North Carolina Triangle DSA, uh, born and raised in North Carolina, lived in North Carolina all my life, and currently in Durham, North Carolina right now. Um, I am an incumbent NPC member. I was appointed in the summer of 2020, and I am going to talk about multiracial organizing. So we believe that if our goal uh, is to win socialism in the United States and abroad, DSA has to do two things. One, reflect the multiracial working class, and two, win demands for that class. So how do we do this? Well, we, we, we have analysis, firstly, of what things we, we cannot continue doing. First, we cannot pretend that race does not exist, for instance. We cannot pretend that our cities and workplaces aren't segregated by race. We can't pretend racial capitalism does not crucially depend on exploiting people of color through policing, prison, and colonialism, right, in addition to the garden variety workplace exploitation, right? We can't ignore the, the rise of white supremacy and the history of white supremacy and white nationalism in this country. And lastly, we can't ignore racism, whether intentional or un unintentional in our own organizing spaces. So this is all to say first that we can't be race neutral, um, that we can't be uh, what's called class reductionist. On the other hand, we can't pretend race is the only thing that exists. Right? We, we can't pretend that all black and brown organizers have the same politics, that we all have good politics, that we're all great organizers, that you should listen to each one of us no matter what at all times, right? That, that is also a bad attitude, that's racial essentialism, right? We can't expect all black organizers, for instance, to represent all working class black people. Um, we don't want a superficial representational politics, we have to be clear that our goal is to organize and win power for working class people. So I've contrasted um, class reductionism on the one hand and then racial essentialism on the other. So we reject both of those approaches and instead advocate an approach that's rooted in uh, organizing and multiracial solidarity. So multiracial organizing has two components, internal and external. So first, we have to strengthen our internal structures and make sure that we're intentional about recruiting and supporting black and brown organizers. Right? At the same time, as Makiko mentioned, we have to make sure DSA is a place that people um, want to be in. Right? We wanna make sure that people of color feel welcome within our spaces. Recruiting won't be terribly effective if we can't retain um, the organizers of color who come into our spaces. Right? At the end of the day, we're organizers who will be spending a lot of time with each other. So our organizing spaces have to be places where we don't feel oppressed. Um, also, however, we have to have external campaigns that win demands for the multiracial working class. And there are different types of campaigns we can talk about. Um, you know, as you know, starting with our track record in abolition, as McKeek, as uh, Christian mentioned, um, Makiko, Christian, and I are all members of the abolition working group. We've managed to put on our first big event last month. Um, we're happy to see the abolition uh, resolution that, that's came up. Um, but we know that in order for that resolution to get implemented, there has to be a critical mass of NPC members that will make that a priority. Um, also, th there are other external campaigns that strongly impact communities of color, like voting rights, reparations, immigration rights, um, internationalism. Um, and also, in, in a way, every issue is a racial justice issue. So, you know, healthcare, labor, eco socialism, um, these, all in, you know, these all impact the multiracial working class. We just have to be clear about applying that lens. So resolution 31, making DSA a multiracial and anti-racial organization, this resolution that we drafted really outlines in more detail the kind of broad vision of multiracial organizing and how to incorporate those two components, internal and external that I just talked about. Um, and I'd love to talk more with it. With it. Uh, I'd love to talk more about the resolution um, in, in more detail, but I wanted to get some context for the resolution first to finish off. Uh, resolution 31 is the, the successor of a previous resolution uh, that I wrote um, um, earlier uh, last year, actually. Um, it's a resolution that uh, prioritized uh, recruitment of people of color, retention, the leadership development of people of color within the organization. Um, the, organi the resolution was passed in February's NPC meeting. And you know, all of us in SMC who are on the NPC currently have been working on that resolution uh, and working to implement it. And there'll be a report actually on this resolution um, that'll be given to the, the entirety of the ESA kind of prior to the convention. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that we have a proven record, right, of concrete, uh, intentional, and national level work on multiracial organizing. I think that's very important. And, and if you elect us, we will be able to continue that work and turn DSA into the organization that we know it can and should be. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jose.
Good evening, uh, comrades. Uh, uh, I'm Jose uh, Laluz. Uh, I go by the pronouns uh, him, uh, he, him, él en español. Uh, I've been a lifelong uh, trade union organizer, educator, campaigner, as well as a lifelong uh, socialist. Uh, and I have learned one uh, basic lesson uh, in more than uh, five decades uh, of organizing uh, workers uh, of color, uh, workers uh, in different uh, parts of the country, in different industries across uh, border. Uh, uh, and that is that uh, there is nothing more uh, fundamental for uh, a socialist uh, organization than to uh, be rooted uh, in the working class, in the multi-racial working class. Uh, and I believe that uh, a resolution uh, 31, as uh, comrade uh, Kevin uh, was uh, uh, explaining, uh, combined with uh, resolution uh, five, uh, on building worker power to win democratic uh, socialism. Uh, these two resolutions are fundamental in terms of the uh, future direction uh, of uh, our organization and indeed the entire uh, socialist uh, movement uh, in this country. Uh, there is nothing more important than the transformation of our organization into a multiracial organization rooted in the multiracial working class. Uh, and resolution five speaks not only to the question of our strategic relationship with the uh, uh, organized uh, labor movement in this country, but most importantly about the necessity of rooting our organization in the multiracial working class. Uh, and uh, that it will require a very deliberate, intentional uh, a organizational change process in order to achieve those two critical goals, uh, the transformation of DSA into a multiracial organization rooted in the working class and the question of building power for workers and with workers among the multiracial working class will require uh, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, a lot of planning. Uh, if there is something I have learned in more than five decades of organizing workers in the deep south, in the textile and garment uh, industries, uh, in the southwest, uh, in uh, the Midwest, uh, in other parts uh, of this country and in my homeland in Puerto Rico, where I had the opportunity to lead a campaign uh, to achieve uh, bargaining rights for more than 120,000 public service workers, and then lead the campaign to organize a coordinated uh, a organizing uh, drive of uh, multiple unions. Uh, that achieve uh, one of the uh, most, uh, uh, one of the largest organizing campaigns in the, hist in the recent history of the labor movement uh, is that uh, a building working uh, class power requires uh, a deliberate intentional uh, planning. Uh, and the uh, uh, highest leadership body in this organization, the National Political Committee, uh, will have to devote a lot of energy, a, a lot of resources, a lot of time uh, to figure out how this process, this organizational change process uh, takes place. This uh, fundamental transformation of our organization into a multiracial organization rooted in the working class uh, in what is now fundamentally a federation of uh, a loose chapters uh, across the country that uh, would be the best way I could characterize uh, a DSA. And I, I can speak 
from firsthand knowledge because I am one of the founding members uh, of DSA. I uh, uh, came in uh, to the Democratic uh, Socialist uh, Organizing Committee uh, uh, in the 19, late 1970s uh, and witnessed and participated in the transformation uh, uh, of uh, uh, this up into uh, the Democratic uh, Socialists uh, of America when it merged with the new American movement. I had been prior to that uh, the organizing secretary of the uh, United States branch of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, where I witnessed firsthand the strategic importance of organizing workers uh, in different parts of the country, but the necessity of building an organization, a socialist organization that is rooted in the multiracial working class. Uh, and that is what, uh, 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 what I am committed to uh, doing. That is the reason uh, why uh, I have uh, uh, become involved in the uh, uh, Socialist Majority Caucus be because I think we have to model uh, this kind of organization that uh, uh, we are devoted and committed to building. Uh, and I, I have not seen any other uh, segment of the organization, any other a caucus in a multi-tendency organization that is more committed to building a multi-racial organization rooted in the working class than the socialist majority caucus. That's why I am very proud to run uh, with this uh, very powerful uh, slate of uh, uh, comrades. And I think uh, we're going to have a lot to do uh, with uh, transforming and turning DSA into a very powerful organization, mass socialist organization uh, in this country. And uh, I don't know who I'm gonna turn this uh, to right now, comrades, I must confess. Uh, I'll turn uh, on there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jose, and to, to all the other speakers. Um, so what we're going to do next is give people opportunities to um, ask uh, questions of the NPC candidates. Um, and uh, we will do that in a little more intimate setting. So we're going to just do breakout rooms. Uh, we will do two sets of breakout rooms. So we'll have about um, a little less than 15 minutes in uh, each one um, where uh, you can um, join with one of the NPC candidates, uh, talk to them about the, the issues that they raised on this call or any other issues. And then um, after about 15 minutes, we'll switch it up and you can pick a second candidate. Um, for anyone who joined late, uh, those candidates again were um, Maikiko, Christian, uh, Kevin, uh, Jose, and Sabrina. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms and my uh, deepest hope is that it is going to prompt you to pick uh, one of those rooms. Um, and if it doesn't, you'll bear with me as I address that. All right, so I just want to thank, I'm David Dualbe again, if you didn't catch me in the first few minutes of it, or if you've never heard of me. Um, I was identified as somebody that people know by Bhaskar Sinhara in the Democratic left. Could be true. Um, but on a more serious note, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into this. And so it really means a lot to me. And I know everyone who organized it for you all to come. I know it's incredibly busy uh, convention season and you have a lot of options <laughs> of things to do. And you chose to spend it with us. And I really can't thank you enough. Um, so I just want to remind you all to please, like, and I'm just coming out of it, but really strongly not only vote for our uh, MPC candidates, but rank them high. Um, it's gonna, whatever system we choose um, at the convention, it, the higher you rank somebody, the most uh, the better it is for them. So it's not just enough to be on the ballot. Um, and I hope you guys got a chance to talk to uh, the candidates more. And if you have more questions, um, feel free to contact us. Um, there'll be follow-up uh, emails as well, uh, where everyone will see Kind of when you're able to be in contact, we will also encourage you guys to support our resolutions, help us support the amendments we're pushing um, as well. Um, there was this call was recorded, so we're going to share that around too. And we really encourage you all to share it with your chapter mates 
delegates, comrades who couldn't come uh, to see all the great presentations and to really understand socialist majority uh, better. Um, so there'll be some follow-up emails as well. Um, so you can get more plugged in uh, with the activities we'll be doing around the convention to mobilize for our agenda and vision. Um, but on that note, I just really want to say thank you again from the bottom of my heart and from the Socialist Majority Caucus. Um, and I really want to wish everyone a great night. Solidarity. Thanks, everyone. Good Thanks to see everyone. y'all. Solidarity. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Solidarity. 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 Solidarity, y'all. Solidarity, everyone. Solidarity. Yeah. Solidarity forever. <laughs>